Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined for a second time by Dr. Luciano Floridi. He is the founding director of the Digital Ethics Center and professor of cognitive science at Yale University. Uh, today we're going to focus on his edited book, The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence for the Sustainable Development Goals. And I would also like to mention that he has two forthcoming books, The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence, Principles, Challenges and Opportuni Opportunities by Oxford University Press, and The Green and the Blue, Naive Ideas to Improve Politics in the Digital Age by Willie. So, Dr. Floridi, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to everyone. Thank you for having me for a second time. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, just to introduce the topic here, uh, what would you say is the ethics of artificial intelligence? Of course, we might get into some of the specific questions it deals with when we get into the UN Sustainable Development Goals later on in the interview, but give us just a brief overview of yeah. this particular field. I think it's helpful uh, for anyone uh, following our uh, interview is to uh, organize all the ethical problems we have with um, uh, AI, in, in general also with technology, uh, in, in sort of macroscopic big um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, containers, if you like. Uh, there is of course the misuse of AI, uh, and, but there are the two. And normally we don't speak about the other two. So misuse is whenever uh, you use something for the wrong purpose, for with wrong goals, uh, doing something that is evil, harmful. Think about uh, the classic things like not breaching privacy, uh, not respecting intellectual property, uh, bias. These are all problems that are uh, magnified by uh, artificial intelligence. Sometimes are made possible, unfortunately, for the first time by artificial intelligence, uh, especially uh, these days when we talk about artificial intelligence, we mean machine learning. Um, so, of course, misuse uh, generates a lot of um, uh, issues. But I'd like to stress also that there are two other sets of problems that uh, seem to be a little bit less um, um, uh, studied or, or uh, highlighted uh, in mass media. Uh, one is the overuse of uh, AI, uh, when, for example, people could do something uh, perfectly well and reasonably with, say, uh, less impact on the environment or a better social outcome, but they decide to use machine learning because it's the fashion, because that's the way everybody does it, because it, it needs to look like updated. Uh, there was a joke by a colleague of mine uh, uh, some time ago saying that they had this startup full of uh, absolutely brilliant people. Uh, in London, but they always said that they were doing everything with the machine learning because it sounded so much better. The truth was that all the analysis were done by amazing PhD students from, from Oxford and Cambridge back in London. So that's, that's overuse happens all the time. Uh, now, if you think of that as also a cost for companies when they decide, oh, we need to you know, put robots in the uh, uh, in this context, in this uh, sort of uh, process, etc. And then two, three years later, they realize that they didn't need to, it was too expensive, the project didn't go anywhere. I mean, we're talking about real companies, Amazon, Walmart, I mean, big players who uh, decide that this is the future and then realize they haven't quite uh, sort of thought through uh, and years later resources, um, sometimes also a negative impact uh, has uh, been uh, unfortunately uh, obtained, um, resources have been wasted and we reconsider. So block number two, not just misuse but also overuse. And then there's the third one which I think we're going to speak more uh, in this interview which is underuse. Uh, if you have the opportunity to do something good and you don't, well, that is a form of evil as well. So imagine I can save a life using a particular technology and I decide not to use it. Well, it's not just, just if you use it for the wrong reasons or you overuse it, but also when uh, the opportunity is missed and it was right there. Now, with the UN uh, development uh, goals, there is a lot of ethical problems that we have not because we're doing something wrong, but because we are not doing something right. Mm -hmm. So let's get then into the sustainable development goals and how AI might apply to them. So for people who are not familiar with them, 
what are the UN Sustainable Development Goals? So um, uh, the list is quite long uh, and it covers uh, many uh, different uh, topics. Um, uh, you may imagine that to be uh, a point about uh, how well we want to live on this planet, essentially. So there's uh, 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 tackling poverty, hunger, uh, good health, uh, uh, education, uh, but also uh, uh, environmental resources like clean water, life on land, um, underwater, climate uh, change. Uh, and then, of course, there's also social issues like justice, uh, robust institutions, um, developing uh, means to uh, reduce inequalities. Now, uh, without giving you the, no, the full list, uh, I mentioned almost all of them, uh, but um, no, the, all these uh, 17 goals, they look a little bit utopian uh, if you look at the list um, and um, they're more like traveling sort of directions uh, or direction towards which we would like to move. It's certainly uh, not uh, reasonable to expect that these 17 goals will be fulfilled by 2030, which is basically tomorrow. All right. We have just a few more years. Uh, meanwhile, if anything, um, the um, parameters, uh, measures concerning these um, goals are showing that we are getting further and further away from fulfilling them rather than even closer and closer. I would be already happy if for each of the 17, we could show that a big chunk of progress has been made. Forget about fulfilling them by 2030, but imagine you now uh, from one to 10, for each of them, one could say, look, it's no, we've made two, three, five steps out of 10 steps. The problem is that in some cases, we actually made a few steps back, minus one, minus two. Uh, like climate change is something that everybody knows, uh, but also, for example, in terms of justice uh, and uh, internationally and inequality, inequality is increasing, uh, mm -hmm. justice is decreasing. As we know, the status of democracies in the world is going not well at all. So 17, they map what the world should look like in an ideal sort of context. Unfortunately, they are not just utopian in terms of when they could be uh, fulfilled, but they're also uh, not realistic in terms of how much progress we're making in achieving them. This introduces the support of technology. Let me just add maybe this uh, quick comment before moving on. Yes. One fundamental way of making sure that these goals are not just you know, essentially empty words uh, in big events uh, at the UN uh, or elsewhere, but they become making a real difference in billions of lives across the world is to uh, leverage this amazing technology that we have, uh, which is all digital technologies, but especially these days, machine learning, uh, AI, and making sure that they are, all these technologies on our side in the fight for society and the environment. We are really running a true existential risk, which is not AI, is the destruction of life on this planet. And because of that, uh, also in terms of social inequalities and the destruction of a decent society, we need to have the technology on our side as a great ally to fight this uh, you know, fundamental uh, battle, which is the battle that will define the 21st century. And so in what ways can artificial intelligence specifically contribute to the sustainable development goals with what we you've just said in mind. Indeed. So let me let me give you a general map and then some very specific examples um, and uh, and also a reference so people can find more. Sure. So the general map is in this case is also tripartite. There are also three general ways in which artificial intelligence at large. So I'm now also including robotics, for example, yeah. natural language processing, uh, uh, whatever automation in terms of AI we can achieve in social media, but also a lot of machine learning, etc. Uh, also, if you like the, the old symbolic AI, uh, not just the uh, neural networks, etc. The whole family of technologies, business uh, strategies, sciences, um, uh, ordinary practices, all that can help uh, uh, to support and develop the, uh, the, the so UN agenda by one, uh, adding so much more knowledge to what we uh, need to do. 
essentially uh, imagine monitoring um, uh, oceans around the world, uh, monitoring, understanding, collecting data, processing data uh, when it comes to climate change, or even uh, the reports we get in terms of the state of health of democracies. This requires an enormous quantity of data. AI is there to help us to collect, process, and therefore inform us so much, much better. Informed uh, evidence-based policies is exactly what we need, and AI there makes a big difference. That's point number one is better knowledge. Point number two is um, better practices. So AI here can help us to do much more which, with much less. It can help us to do things differently from what we did in the past, but also to do things for the first time. A couple of examples here, um, very trivial, every day, so we know. Uh, the whole world, for example, of electricity, uh, a huge impact of AI there would be precisely in doing much, much more with much, much less. The, imagine now the difference between a candle, a bulb, and a lead. I mean, we consume a fraction of a fraction of um, energy uh, for a much better performance. Now, all that can be supported, developed, or uh, further uh, enhanced by uh, machine learning. For, for sure. Or imagine, for example, the uh, central heating of, of a house or a whole city. Imagine managing a whole city, uh, no, uh, uh, twin cities, um, digital uh, twins, um, uh, smart cities. They all need an enormous amount of computational power and a lot of uh, smart technologies. So that point number two. So one, more knowledge. Two, better management, better uh, understanding of how we can save doing more with less or doing things differently or doing them for the first time, for example, cold fusion, if it will ever happen, it will be because AI has given us a big hand in handling the massive amount of data that cold fusion requires to be even remotely sort of uh, feasible as a uh, ordinary uh, technology. Point number three uh, is also in terms of uh, enabling us to coordinate, collaborate, uh, cooperate much, much better. If you need to put so much um, uh, brain power, so much goodwill and so much technology behind a solution of a problem, well, surely you need a lot of uh, coordination, cooperation, etc. And that's where these tools uh, can help a lot. So uh, to synthesize better knowledge, better practice, better uh, cooperation, that's where AI can make a big difference and transform the, uh, the UN goals into a realistic ambition, as opposed to just utopia. But is this something that the UN itself is already considering, that is, applying AI as a possible means to achieving or taking steps toward achieving these development goals? Um, well, um, well, the UN is, uh, looks favorably on uh, this sort of uh, kind of technologies. And uh, if you want to look at uh, very practical cases in which uh, the UN goals have been implemented, um, uh, there's now a, a database uh, is uh, sort of hosted in Hong Kong, uh, which I think collects, um, I go by memory, so and things change constantly. So it might be a bit more than uh, 250 projects uh, around the world, um, there could be 300, um, where you find actual real AI, not just blueprints, not just, oh, I wish I could do this or a project, real AI in place for some time. So um, uh, at least, no, I think about half the data were collected by uh, a project that I uh, led here in Oxford. Uh, uh, so back back in Oxford, uh, not here yet, but back in Oxford uh, at the time um, um, to support exactly these kind of projects. And um, projects that also show a positive impact and no obvious counter effects. So we're looking at um, uh, concrete examples from say, submarine robots to uh, app uh, to manage um, uh, fire hazard in California or uh, in other countries, etc. Uh, across the world, um, from you know, the big continents, from uh, say South America to Africa, uh, Australia, Europe, North America, etc., um, showing that it is possible. So the question really is: Are we doing enough? Is this the kind of uh, 
push that we need to uh, um, support. Because at the moment, these two, two or 300 projects are too small, um, not sufficiently funded. Um, they are more proofs of concept rather than making the kind of macroscopic difference that would put set our agenda on the right track in terms of fulfilling the 17 UN goals. So yes, it can be done, that's the proof, but are we doing it? Not yet. So I would like to ask you now something that probably many people would consider here as a potential risk or potential issue, that is, uh, some of these AI technologies are developed by uh, private companies. So do you think that at least to some extent we should be worried about that, particularly when keeping in mind one of the issues you raised right at the beginning when you said that uh, we have to think about potential uh, misuse of AI technology? I think we should be worried. Um, we should be worried for the right reasons, though. Not just being worried is not good enough. Sure. Uh, imagine someone who is not feeling well, uh, and he thinks that uh, it's something wrong with, uh, I don't know, the uh, lungs, but actually it's something wrong with the stomach. Um, just answering the question, oh, you should be worried, is not good enough. One should be worried about the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And the right reasons are, uh, some uh, already highlighted in your question, uh, these are private companies. Um, they haven't embraced yet, not enough, uh, not uh, sort of uh, in full or sufficiently, the environmental and social calls. They are still stuck in a 20th century mentality where profit is the only you know, uh, ethical uh, demand on their management. Well, no, 21st century, that is not enough. So um, companies like uh, OpenAI, for example, uh, they should be doing way more and much, much better in terms of addressing social and environmental issues. At the moment, they are not. And in fact, what they are trying to do is to distract us from the real problems. That's why I said, be worried about the real issues. Claiming that AI might be an existential threat um, is just a distraction. It's science fiction and it's the sure way of making clear that nothing is going to change because you no know, something extraordinary and apocalyptic is happening not true not going to happen not now not tomorrow not never the real problems are human beings misusing underusing or overusing ai and for these three things you need to look for the humans now, sometimes humans uh, have more responsibility than others. And if you are the CEO of a big company, surely uh, that's you, know, you are so well paid also because you have more responsibilities. So um, I would expect uh, being worried about what these companies are doing, as I said, first of all, because they are not addressing social and environmental issues uh, at all or not enough. The second problem, if I may, is because they are not uh, sufficiently accountable. Now, legislation is coming, as we know, especially in Europe with the AI Act. Uh, there's a lot of rumor about new legislation also coming to the United States, even rumor that the legislation might be uh, sort of in agreement or coherent with the AI Act in Europe. Now, there would be a, a double sort of Brussels Washington effect, which I would welcome strongly. Um, in fact, if anything, I've been sort of in my small sort of uh, uh, role, uh, I've been contributing to that in so far uh, as I could with not many, many other people, of course. So a uh, Washington Brussels effect would um, uh, reduce a lot uh, the risk of unaccountability of these companies, which as I said, is the second half. So they're not doing enough and they're not accountable enough. They should do much more and they should be much more accountable. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps we can come back more to this issue if in the near future we do an interview about your forthcoming book, The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. But With I would pleasure. like to ask you a little bit more about something that you just mentioned there, because I'm very curious. At a certain point, you said that um, when it comes to considering AI a potential existential risk or existential threat, we shouldn't take that too seriously. So, I, I mean, is that really what you mean, that we shouldn't take it too seriously or seriously at all? Because I'm asking you that because uh, we've heard recently, particularly with the rise of technologies like chat, GPT, uh, people, uh, experts in AI uh, uh, sounding the bells about potential uh, 
existential threats to humanity. So you don't agree with that? Yeah, we need to be clear about what we mean by existential threats. So, okay. for example, if one says, look, I could use this technology to, uh, say, hack a uh, nuclear power um, uh, place and uh, make a mess. Well, that's an existential trick risk. Mm -hmm. Would you like to blame AI? No, it would be me using AI. Or, well, someone could be so silly to um, produce autonomous weapons, like autonomous, completely autonomous drones that could just um, uh, be 100% autonomous, identif identify target and shoot on target. Is that perfectly possible? Absolutely. I mean, we, we have been able to do that for years now. So uh, this is not science fiction, it's like off the shelf stuff. Right. So if the existential risk is, can a, any of this technology be used to destroy humanity on this planet? Yes. Is the technology the problem? No. If we, the uh, AI existential risk is something like AI is coming, will take over, will become independent, singularity, that is science fiction. But by mixing the two, you can okay. see what happens. Uh, people start blaming the technology as opposed to the people behind the technology. So uh, what I'm stressing here is, look, ChatGPT, can I use ChatGPT to say, for example, create um, so, so many uh, unbelievable fakes, dal here as well, pictures and text, to make people believe that, say, something horrible has happened, and boom, well, uh, the stock exchange so collapses. Etc. Of course, this is this is just no, no uh, everyday uh, no, uh, knowledge. I mean, denying it would be denying facts. But is it ChatGPT going to become? conscious, take a life of its own, have goals, pursue its own life. Is ChatGPT uh, going to run away with Roomba, my no, robot, and have a great holiday with my bank account and my you know, sort of, uh, credit card? Science fiction. And I'm using you know, this as a bit of a joke. Roomba will not run away with the robot that cuts my grass right there uh, to have a great holiday uh, somewhere else uh, with my credit card because it's just technology. Nothing more, nothing less. So the real point is who is, not what is, but who is the existential risk? People. It would be like saying that nuclear bombs are an existential risk in themselves. No, they are the people behind those nuclear bombs. <laughs> and uh, you know, the, the nuclear bomb in and of itself doesn't have a will, a desire, intentions, a consciousness. It's just a piece of, unfortunately, you know, uh, terrible technology that we have been uh, able to build. So. Unless we make this distinction clear, people will simply discharge their responsibility. And that's what you know, some of the noise we, we hear these days, like, oh, it wasn't my fault. AI did it. No, my dear. If AI did it, someone designed the AI, no, decided that it was a good idea to use the AI, didn't turn it off when it was the time to turn it off, etc. So let's be clear. A responsibility for anything going wrong is 100% human and will be 100% human forever. So, mm -hmm. on record, forever. Anything mm -hmm. else is science fiction. Too much of Star Wars. And it's not accidental that all this is coming from a Californian culture. Now, trust me, the real existential risks are, for example, every morning, 800 million people not having access to clean water. That is 800 million human beings every morning not having access to clean water. Are we really joking that, no, chat GPT is the problem? Or we, with an enormous amount of money that we make out of all this, don't spend one-tenth of their money to save 800 million uh, people from zero water or uh, water that cannot be drunk. Well, surely, no, it must be nice to be in the 1% being worried about science fiction scenarios when the rest of the world is going uh, down the drain. So it's not really about worrying about the technology itself, but worrying about who is using it and how, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What for? Who is using it? For what purposes? In what circumstances? Mm -hmm. Is this a good technology uh, for the right purpose? Or are you uh, overdoing it, etc.? But the existential risk that these people are talking about are the singularity risk. Mm -hmm. These are the you know, um, terminator kind of risk. 
That is a joke and it's a bad one because meanwhile, we are destroying society, the environment and human lives on this planet. Do we really want to be worried about why we're dancing on the Titanic, whether the robot will or will not drink, uh, no, uh, bring drinks to us, uh, or will uh, actually be start shooting uh, around as if we were in a bad horror movie sci-fi? Please, I mean, I fear that all this distraction is not just um, caused by an excess uh, of uh, desire to see more in the technology than there is, um, but it's also done on purpose. I mean, these people are too smart, some of them, not to know that this is science fiction. So what is the purpose here? It's precisely so that nothing changes. You make so much noise about so many irrelevant things that the fundamentals are not addressed. Imagine we, uh, if during the COVID uh, sort of pandemic, we had been worried about zombies, because that's what happened now. We are in a, no, serious circumstances of undermining life on this planet. Meanwhile, we are worried about, no, Star Wars, zombies, robots taking over. This is not just silly, it's irresponsible. And uh, talking about one very real issue we have to deal with, uh, climate change, that's also part of the UN Sustainable Development Goal. So, um, of course, we are already dealing with it, but do you think that uh, artificial intelligence can also play a role to deal with this specific issue? Oh, definitely. I mean, this will be fundamental. I mean, the whole plan of uh, decarbonization uh, and green energy uh, relies hugely on uh, machine learning. Um, some uh, of the uh, progresses we have seen, some of the real differences we've seen in the development of technologies for the environment, in support of the environment, uh, even the design of those technologies, you know, better say solar panels and so on. There's a lot of um, uh, data processing and smart solutions that need to be found at the source. Or imagine, for example, uh, the design of uh, artifacts like cars. Now these days we, we want to design cars in such a way that increasingly, if not all, uh, of a, a car can be um, recycled at the end of the process. Well, again, re redesigning cars so that they are 100% uh, recyclable. That requires modeling, simulation, a lot of data uh, analysis, uh, a lot of monitoring, of course, a lot of data collection, but also a lot of data uh, crunching. And that can be done uh, perfectly by uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, traffic. I mean, imagine if one no, using just a bit of uh, AI could reduce, say, by 10% traffic in, in, in a city. It also means 10% of less sort of impact, et cetera, et cetera. So wherever, um, no, we come from, broadly speaking, we come from a world that has used analog technologies. Imagine the engine, uh, the petrol engine, no, as a sort of typical, uh, or the fridge, no, analog technologies to uh, make sure that human lives could be improved. And we have saved millions of lives, improved millions of lives, thanks to analog technologies that have produced more, uh, more cheaply for everybody, uh, saved, uh, say, suffering and so on. However, to do that, we have done so much harm to the environment, climate change and so forth, that now we need to switch from analog to digital. And thanks to a much, much, much better uh, handling of, of data, and therefore processes, make sure that this shift makes technology not an enemy, not like the analog technology or the environment, but a friend. Now, this is totally doable. In fact, I hope that uh, in the long term, both uh, uh, the EU and the US will be at the forefront of uh, a you know, environmentally friendly uh, sort of uh, machine learning uh, deployment, because ultimately this could be uh, good for business, society, and the environment. And this is the last comment no, following your question. There is a tendency coming from the past century that you need to sacrifice one of the three. So either humanity you know, enjoys you know, cheaper products, you know, uh, better traveling, for example, etc., um, or better health, better living uh, standards of living, etc. Uh, but then you have to you know, pollute, destroy, consume the environment, um, uh, or 
you save the environment, but then uh, society, humanity has to suffer. Not true. That is the digital revolution. You can do both. You can both have uh, you know, a healthy environment with a, you know, sort of a healthy and prosperous society and therefore good business. It's just that we need to change our 20th century way of thinking. If our uh, capitalism is only consumeristic and it's not a capitalism that invests in, makes sort of the environment and uh, investing in the environment part of the profit, well, then we're still stuck with the wrong mentality. We still produce, destroy, etc. We start getting into the usual model, circular economy, recycling, uh, repaying, uh, etc. Uh, then we live in you know, a way that is compatible with those three uh, points that I made. Good society, good business, uh, and a good environment. It's totally doable. Ultimately, the problem, to be honest, is political. Uh, the technology is there, the finance is there, the interest is there, we're um, really missing a big deficit in political will. So when it comes to another issue that sometimes people point to when we think about uh, technologies like AI or any other kind of technology as a potential solution to problems, is that uh, some people say or bring to the table the criticism that uh, there are people that sort of think of technology in a techno solutionist sense that is so we just we should just wait for new technological developments to occur and things like ai for example can work as a sort of panacea for all problems so do, do you think that's a valid criticism of the ideas of that certain people have and that we should uh, be wary of uh, clay of techno solutionist claims or not? I think so. I mean, I think that uh, uh, it's the counterpart of thinking that uh, technology has a mind of its own. I mean, techno solutions are such only because someone has designed the right circumstances, uh, incentive, mm -hmm. disincentives, policies, uh, regulation, etc., to make them solutions. Um, otherwise, it could be uh, just a big problem. Like imagine you know, we have uh, the usual example of nuclear power. I mean, it could be an amazing solution or a, a, the ultimate disaster. Uh, you can't simply say, oh, nuclear power will, will solve the problem. Well, it depends on how we use it. Um, it depends also, for example, whether it makes sense today to use nuclear power. If you have it, no, I think that's a good idea. But building uh, nuclear power stations, I don't think is a good idea. It's too much of an investment for too long term. We should invest much more in, in renewables. It doesn't mean that nuclear power is not a good idea. It was, and wherever it is there, we should not uh, rush into dismantling nuclear power stations, not at all. They can you know, provide the perfect transition. But then again, this is all human decisions. So behind all this, there is a lot of design, design of the rules, design of the kind of projects you want to put in place, design of society you want to live in. Uh, technology is ultimately always a means to an end but who decides which means and what ends is entirely you know, up to us so any techno solvism or techno solution um, makes sense only within the framework of essentially socio-political decisions and legal implementations of them anything else once again is just pretending that someone somewhere either is going to make a disaster or is going to save us but we're not in charge what I need to do normally with, you know, in this kind of uh, in context that you were mentioning is to remember everybody, sorry, to remind everybody that it's just human responsibility. There are no gods, there is no AI, there is no techno solution. Uh, if you don't do it, no one will do it for us. And if we do it badly, it will only be our responsibility. But this complete 100% human responsibility it's really hard to digest. People constantly look for some gods, destiny, AI, tomorrow will be something else, you know, aliens, uh, you name it, uh, um, ghost of uh, any other kind, as long as it's not us, but it is us, only us. 
So I think that's a great uh, note to end on. I'm also getting mindful of your time, Dr. Floridi. And uh, just to mention the book again, The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence for the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview and also to your forthcoming books. Uh, the first one, The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. I, as I said, hope to have you again on the show to talk about it. And um, I don't know if you would like to mention also where people can find you and your work on the internet before we go. Yes, so uh, um, uh, if you are around Yale and uh, uh, we are, uh, as, a, as, as we speak literally during this interview uh, with, uh, with Ricardo, we're just uh, creating the website of the center. The center is being built. Um, uh, it's a bright new center. Uh, we also owe to uh, uh, the usual uh, generous donor, uh, a very large, uh, generous endowment. So we'll be hiring. Um, and um, uh, you will find uh, me in New Haven, uh, Yale University. Uh, I'm sure that if you Google, you will find the address. Uh, but above all, you will find us soon on the uh, on the internet with a website where we will be advertising uh, positions. So uh, please uh, join us if you can. Great. So I'm also leaving a link to our first interview in the description box of this one. And thank Dr. You. Floridi, thank you again so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please do not forget to like it, share, comment and subscribe. And if you like more generally what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You, get, you have all of the links in the description of this interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Pereira Larsen, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbur Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Triago Duns, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Librant, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tam Amal, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Panos Cortesos, Lalitska, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Morten Eichland, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stéphanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Olozen, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Eriksson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amory Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Holt Erickbud, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Tom Roth, the RPMD, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Manuel Oliveira, Kimberly Johnson, and Benjamin Galbart. A special thanks to my producers, these are Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Tom Vanegdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.